<laughs> well, welcome everyone tonight. We're really excited to have everyone here. And a welcome to all those people at home that are zooming into us. It's wonderful to have you here as well. Even though you're here virtually, we miss you not being here in person, but we're happy that you're sitting here virtually with us. As we begin every program at the Silver Tides, if you're able, please stand while we say the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you all for joining us tonight. And I'm very excited to be able to give you a presentation on the USS Flyer. It is one of our wonderful stories that combines the big picture of military history with bringing it back to being local. And we always try to do that as much as we can here at the museum, because there are so many men and women of the military that have served from this area that they deserve their little bit in history. And it always seems really nice to be able to bring those stories back to the local area. So our presentations tonight are sponsored by a wonderful foundation from Holland, the Fred Birch Senior Foundation. And they are a couple that wow. met during World War II and served. After they served, they were married and they came back to, to Holland area to raise their families. And they felt that one of the greatest gifts that you can give to anyone is service to your community. The children set up the foundation in their honor to honor their memory of service to community, whether that service is at the state, federal, local, or community level, and education is a large portion of that. So we thank them for the generous support of this lecture series. In addition to the Birch Foundation, we also have Blue Lake Fine Arts, their radio station, which sponsors us, and they are a media sponsor. They're absolutely incredible, and we appreciate them. Thank all of you for coming that joined us last week. And we still have nine more weeks, including this evening, to go through World War II in the Pacific. And as I was getting through and putting the lectures together, we could have done 24 weeks. We could have done 36 weeks. There are so many incredible stories, and it's wonderful to be able to share them with people to talk about the wonderful things the men and the women of the United States did during World War II. And we're thank you forever to them. For those of you that know us, our mission is simple. It's to honor the veterans. And we do that through education and preservation. And you can all see the preservation we work, we do every day at the museum in maintaining our two vessels and all the artifacts that we have there at the museum, and then education. We find that it's very hard for people to honor something that they know nothing about. So whether it be through our lecture series, our classes for young people, tours, the living learning experiences that they have around the museum, they walk away with a much better appreciation of the people that served in World War II and all of our military people. And so we thank them for all of that. We do this all without state, federal, and local funding. It is all done through the kind and generous donations of our community, the admissions, and the gift store sales. And so we thank everyone for doing that and your memberships are very important. And I appreciate all of the people that took posters and put them around town. I got several phone calls from people saying, I saw that sign. I saw that poster. And so thank you very much. There are more in the gift store. So if you happen to know of another place that might like one, please, by all means, take them with you and put them up around the neighborhood. Because the biggest question you have in advertising is, <clears throat> excuse me, how do you let people know that you don't, that don't know you exist? And you want them to come to your website, you want them to go to your Facebook, but if they don't know you exist, you have to do that. So I appreciate each and every one of you for going back and doing that. And we appreciate having you here. Now tonight's story, and it's truly that, it's an incredible story that I find <clears throat> much more exciting than the PT-109 story. And I mean, the PT-109 story is a much more well-known topic than the USS Flyer, but it has its merits 
but I think it's because it involves submarines that I like it so much more. But next week, we will be having a talk about the PT-109. And we will be talking about the president that got rescued by a submarine that was an airman. And we're going to be talking about all the presidents that served in the Pacific theater of war. And so we're very much looking for Fred Johnson to talk about that and to bring all of those stories around. Because when you think about it, five presidents served in the Pacific. And then three more presidents were involved in World War II, but just not the Pacific. And we had Mr. Reagan, President Reagan, who did not leave the United States. We had another gentleman, Mr. Eisenhower. He may or may not have done something in the other side of the world. And then we had Mr. Carter, who was still studying when World War II was going on. And he was in the post-World War II era. And he was our only president that actually served on submarines. We will talk about Mr. Bush's services on a submarine, but it wasn't really by choice as he was rescued and he needed to be somewhere until they could get him back to port. So that will be our topics of discussion for next week, and it should be a very exciting topic. Tonight's lecture includes all the things that a novel that you would read contains. It has intrigue. It has suspense. It has a little fear. It has good natured people. It has clues to what to do. It has ingenuity. It has the story of the ability to continue on. And if you didn't know that there was a true story, you would have thought that someone came up with it and that they created it all on their own and that it was a figment of their imagination. It wasn't. There was actual young men, and we're going to meet a few younger women who were younger at the time, that actually were involved in this as well. And it's an amazing thing of how all these pieces all fell together at the same time so that these young men could, be survive, could survive. Because survival rate among submariners that sank in the Pacific, especially in Japanese occupied waters, is not very good. The Japanese did not think that being taken prisoner was something that you should do. They felt that you were dishonoring yourself by becoming a prisoner of war, that it was better to fight until the death or to take your own life to do that. They couldn't understand why people would give themselves up. And there's many, many harrowing stories of times when American soldiers or other allied forces were taken prisoner of war by the Japanese, and they didn't fare very well. And they did not treat them very well because of the mentality that they had about prisoners of war. And so you think about that as a young person going out into conflict, and you're facing all of these things. You're young, you're 19 and 20. I remember when I was 19, 20, 21, I really wasn't thinking about saving the world. I really wasn't thinking about, you know, doing my job to the best of my ability because democracy depends on it. I was probably thinking about when's the next party? Where am I going on the next date? What kind of car am I gonna be picked up in? Those kind of things. And that's what's going on in the young, mind, the young minds of the men of the USS Flyer. They are coming off of their first war patrol. They're going out on their second war patrol. And <clears throat> the time that they have is not thinking, we're going to save the world and we're going to do something so impactful that 80 years from now, people are still going to be talking about it. They're not thinking about that. They're thinking they have a job to do and that they're ready to do it. What I'm going to do tonight, if it's all right with everyone here, is I'm going to talk from the back of the room so that you can see the screen. I have several embedded clips of videos in the PowerPoint, and they all seem to have worked perfectly fine when I was going through it. But just in case, I have them stored also on the desktop. So in case they don't run the way that they're supposed to run, I want to be a little closer back to the desktop for that. So without further ado, we will start talking about the USS Flyer. 
And by the way, if you have not had a chance to come and look at that exhibit, there are many interesting artifacts in that exhibit, and I will talk about them towards the end of it. But please feel free at any time when you're in the area to come back and take a tour and look at all the artifacts that are available that tell the story of the men that served on the USS Flyer. The Philippine Islands, we all heard about what happened on the Philippine Islands right after Pearl Harbor. Right after Pearl Harbor, the Japanese attacked the Philippine Islands. They knew that that needed to be a stronghold for them in their race to move further to secure what they had and what they needed to secure. And if you look, the Philippine Islands are far, far away from the United States. And so how do you put people on there to defend those islands when they're not close to home? This is the lobby of the museum. And as you walk in, you're greeted with the banners from the USS Wire exhibit. And then there's that bell that's right there in the middle of the room. The reason that the bell is there is because that is the bell from the USS Redfin. The Redfin has a Lake Michigan connection. As I said, we like to do all things local whenever possible. The USS Redfin was created and made in Manitowoc, Wisconsin. And um, she is the hero of this story in many ways. She is the beginning and the end of this story. And she and her crew serve an impressive role that's not documented very often, about what some mariners did during World War II and oftentimes never got credit for it. The Americans knew once they lost the Philippines to Japan, they needed information. So they reached out to the Filipino community and they looked for young men that could speak the language like a native, that looked like the natives, that could be embedded on the island. They formed the 978th Signal Corps. It was a volunteer mission. No one was drafted into this. You could have been drafted into the Signal Corps, but you were not drafted into being a coast watcher. These men went through specialized training and they were not only taught how to send and receive messages, how to string wires, how to do the important things in order to keep communications. They were told, this is a totally clandestine mission that you will never be able to talk about, that you will never be able to tell your family, <clears throat> excuse me, never be able to tell your family where you're going. You will, your letters will home will be so censored that the only thing that they will know is say, dear mom, love ya, Joe. Everything else will be censored because what they're doing is something so secretive and they are so utterly important. We always hear about the coast watchers, the British coast watchers, they were embedded on the islands that provided intelligence. The United States had the same. They took this group of volunteers, Americans of Filipino descent, that volunteered to go back behind the enemy lines on the Philippines. And as I started the talk here, we talked about how the Japanese did not treat their prisoners of war very well. They did not like coast watchers very much either. They were some of their least favorite people because the coast watchers were providing intelligence back to the Americans. So when these gentlemen were hiding out in the jungles with their binoculars, with their radios and blending into the community, they were the ones that were letting them know about the troop movements. They were the ones that told the American military about there's a large convoy coming in. I just saw a certain number of soldiers flying by. I saw this type of plane flying over with. And they gave them tools that could be used in the community that would help them when they blended in. The Coast Watchers worked very closely with another little known group that was on the island. Not everyone on the island of the Philippines was happy with the Japanese. Not very many of them were. 
And so a group of men and a few women banded together to fight off the Japanese. And they were called guerrillas at this point. And they were stationed all over the island and they would create acts of mischief that they couldn't enter into full scale war with them because they didn't have the ability to. But they could do acts of sabotage, they could relay information, and they could help people that were in need. And so when the coast watchers were brought onto the island, they met up with the guerrillas. And because these gentlemen were picked specifically so that they could blend into the community, they were hidden by the guerrillas. And they were given huts apart from the community, but they were very much a part of the community. And as I said, that submarine, the USS Redfin, was very important because it was the USS Redfin that delivered our Coast Watchers that saved the crew of the flyer to the island. The Redfin submerged one evening in June of 1944, and it quietly entered into the bay. It offloaded 5,000 pounds of supplies, food, equipment, and extra things for the community and the Coast Watchers under the cover of darkness on small rubber rafts. They floated into the bay. They offloaded their items in very quick order. The submarine submerged and went away. When the Coast Watchers got on to the submarine, <clears throat> So that no one would know the difference between them and a typical enlisted person on a submarine, they were given other uniforms that were from the Navy, not the uniforms that they should have had. It is only right before the submarine submerged, excuse me, popped up in the bay that they changed into their actual uniforms. Everyone knew something was going on, but intelligence was so tight. These men were sworn to secrecy, and it wasn't until the late 1980s that they were actually allowed to talk about their time on the Philippine Islands. The leader of our particular group of coast watchers on the Philippine Islands in our area here, in the area of Bogusuk, his name is Philip Placida. Philip Placida was born in Chicago. His parents owned the bakery there. And he was your typical young man growing up in a large urban area. His parents decided that they would move to California because the prospects were better there. And the family opened a bakery in California. And the family ran that bakery up until almost 1990. And that family was known as the premier cake decorators for weddings in their community and they were a well-respected family they all knew that philip served but no one knew until his death notice appeared in the newspaper about his time as being embedded on an enemy occupied island to provide intelligence back to our country he was sworn to secrecy whenever anyone asked about him he just said he was in the signal corps he strang wires that's what he did <laughs> He answered a few radio calls, played it down. But when he came home, he liked to work for the family business and he was the most sought after wedding cake baker in his community there. He is the man that kept this group of gentlemen going the entire time that they were embedded on the island. This next clip is from, <clears throat> Oh, sorry. This is the hut. There's only two known photos of the actual coast watchers that are embedded on the island. This is one of them, and the other one is in the exhibit. Because there was such a clandestine organization that they didn't want anything to get out there, but they needed to have some proof that they were there. And if you're looking at our gentlemen, they look like they bred in. And if you notice, there is one of the gentlemen there that has a carbine rifle slung over its back, and he has a radio there. And the battery is being charged by one of the other gentlemen pedaling a bicycle because there was no electricity easily accessed for them to do. 
they blended in with the community. They had friends, neighbors, relatives, and even after the war, two of these post walkers stayed in that community because they had married young ladies from that community. And they became a permanent fixture of that community. The two people you see here are two residents of the town that they were in on the island of Moksa. And at the time, they were children when all of this was going on. Bob, on the gentleman, he was about 13 when the war started and about 17 when the war ended. But a young man of that age may not have involved in active fighting, but he had many things that he had to do. And his sister had many recollections of what it was like to be part of this whole thing. And they didn't understand it. These were oral histories that we did with these coast watch, uh, these people that knew the coast watchers and knew the people down the flyer and were there when they were being hidden out from the Japanese. One of the stories that we did not get on tape was <clears throat> when she was a little girl, the submarine would come up in the middle of the night and no one would know that they had been there. But everyone knew that they had been there because the next day there was food in the village. And so in for cooperation with supporting the post watchers, the American military supplied them. And she would talk about peanut butter. They had plenty of peanut butter in the, in the Philippines, but American peanut butter was just infinitely so much better. So she would know and everyone in town would know that there had been something that happened the night before and they had been resupplied because there was American peanut butter that day. She also talks about in one of her long, I mean, we have several hours worth of these oral histories, that one of the things that the Coast Watchers needed was when they were in bed in the island is they needed money. They needed to have script to buy the supplies that could not be delivered to them. They needed money to pay for their food, any other things that they needed, and possibly every once in a while, a bribe or something. And everything on a submarine that's delivered comes in a can. And the reason that this is, is because submarines run on diesel and the diesel generates power that charges up the battery, but a submarine smells like diesel all the time. So everything that is on a submarine smells like diesel. Now, you wouldn't want your peanut butter smelling like diesel. We even have in the exhibit a can of cigarettes because cigarettes would have smelled like diesel as well. And she told the story about how one night the submarine came and it restocked them. And the next morning, her father, who happened to be Captain Mayor, who was the chief gorilla in the area, woke up all the little six-year-old girls in the community and he brought them to the house. And none of them knew what was going on, and they're but these were their family members, these were their neighbors, everything was friendly. They were given peanut butter. Then they were handed canisters of money because the money had gotten wet coming up because the can had been damaged. And so all the little six-year-old girls washed the money and hung it up on the clothesline to dry. But this is a quote in talking about what it is that having the Coast Watchers before the Flyer people got there and what it was like to be with them in their community. And then they blended in very, very nicely. And then um, there was so much cooperation with the civilians, the guerrillas, because they know that, that we were really fortunate because of them too, mm -hmm. because they could relay messages to Australia. And sometimes if we are attacked, they could send airplanes to work, yeah, to yeah, to help us out, you know. Or then the Japanese would be so scared, you know. Yeah, yeah. Um, that was one of the quotes that we had <clears throat> from them that talked about why they appreciated having the Coast Watchers on the island. Now, the other extreme of that is 
the crew of the USS Flyer. And as you can see from these photos, they're very young. They used to call Commander Crowley Grandpa. He was the ripe old age of 32, but he was the oldest on the sub. And he, to them, was like Grandpa. And it's a young group of young men that have bright futures in front of them. This is their party before they ship off onto their second war patrol. There is 86 men that are about to board the USS Flyer and head off into fighting a war and doing their best to save the world for democracy. The USS Flyer is the USS 250. The photo here is of our own vessel, but she is nearly identical to what we have, what they have and what they served on. And so if you ever wish to get a feeling for what type of life these men had on board, the submarine is almost identical to the USS Silversides. She was just made a few months after her in, the, in California. And so if you ever want to have that feeling, please go back onto the Silversides. And if you go down when, just after we've started the engines, you'll get the feeling of the, um, the smell of the diesel and the tightness of the air and everything that is on there. Submarine service, you're selected for submarine service. You choose to be in submarine service. You cannot be drafted into submarine service. And when I say you're selected for it, many people apply, but not everyone is accepted for it because you really have to be a special kind of person. You have to be a person that is willing to live in a tight little tube with 85 or so of your best buddies, living elbow to elbow in extremely tight quarters, sleeping very close to each other, having to trust the people that you work with so closely because it's not like you can look out a window and see what's going on. You have to trust that commanding officer that that commanding officer is in complete control and understands everything. And there's some downtime, but every single person on that sub has a job to do. And there is a lot of maintenance to do. Their mission when they left Australia was to go through the Babylon Straits and see if they were mined. Because anti-submarine mines were something that could trap, trap any submarine out there. It could blow up any ship. It could do massive amounts of damage. And unfortunately for a submarine, they had the highest death toll in the military because oftentimes when a submarine went down, you lost the entire crew of 80 or so men at a time. The escape from a submarine that was submerged could happen, but it's very difficult and rarely happened. They also, their secondary mission at this time, there was another submarine that had gone missing in that same area, the Roblo. Then they were wondering if they could find out what happened to them and to see if there was wreckage or if they could find them because maybe they had lost communication, maybe that they had to scuttle their vessel, maybe they were on the islands. Unfortunately, the crew of the Roblo, those that managed to survive were tipped up by the Japanese and they were put into a prisoner of war camp on the Philippine Islands. That was terrible. And those that were able to survive the POW camp there were never quite the same again. It was a horrific experience. So here you have this group of young men sailing off into the dangers of night, knowing what their mission is, knowing that they have a job to do, but not really knowing that they have a certain future at all. They are going through the Palawan Straits. They are up on the surface of the water at that point, because the way a submarine works is that in order to charge the batteries that you use while you're underwater, you run the diesel's engines to charge them. But in order to charge the diesel engines, you have to be on top of the water because diesel engines need oxygen to run. And so therefore then they have to come up. When they come up, 
they put a group of people out on deck. They have people in the shears during the watch. They have the commanding officers, the navigation officers. They come up and they check the stars to make sure that they're actually in the right position that they think they are. And it's a chance to get out of the sub for just even a few minutes. Most men don't ever get that opportunity during war patrol to actually see the light of day. So it's evening. There's a few cracks of thunder. There's a little bit of lightning in the sky, but it relatively calm. <coughs> They're going along, everything seems fine. They're all thinking of different things. When, bam, something happens and the submarine sinks in less than a minute. This is what Alvin Jacobson had to say about that. He is one of the survivors. We hit the mine. We we're going at 15 knots and then bow went and just drove it right straight down. So I was in the water swimming and it sucked under, and the only thing I could think of it is that propellers coming around. And so I swam to the surface. 15 seconds, maybe 30 seconds at the most, and it was gone. So we're swimming. 15 survivors, many of whom were injured and covered in diesel fuel, gathered around the Andrew Crowley. Can you imagine? Your world changes in less than a minute. You go from being a young person that is on a submarine that is heading into a war patrol to sitting in the water, swimming, trying to get yourself back up to the top of the ocean, trying to not get sucked under as the submarine is sinking, trying to avoid the slicks of oil, trying to avoid the fires that are happening, trying to see if anyone is alive, trying to see is there anyone out there that I can be with or am I all alone in the middle of the ocean and no one knows where we're at. And I think that's an awful lot for a young person. I can't imagine doing it physically at my age. I can't imagine doing it mentally and to think that we have a group of young people that now are presented with life and death and they really don't know what the future will hold. The gentlemen that were able to survive had to get together and band together and try and make the best of it. And I'll let Alvin tell us in his own words what they did. They probably got us together and uh, we made the gentlemen agreement that everybody for themselves, you're not supposed to ask for help or anything like that. For many, injuries and the exhausting swim proved too much. Lieutenant Casey, for some reason, he had a good swim on his stomach. He could only swim on his back and he couldn't see. And this one time he got quite a ways from us. So I went over to get him and I said, just rest and put your feet on my shoulder and I'll push it back to him. Oh, God, he fought. He wouldn't think about it. Less than an hour later, I was looking for him, and he was gone. He just swam off to one side and uh, gave up. Dawn came, and of the 15 men who surfaced after the explosion, only eight remained. At last, a small island came into view. The small island was Banyan Island. What Mr. Jacobson does not talk about at that point is that when Commander Foley called them all together, they actually had the navigation officer with them. And the navigation officer was able to tell them because he had been on the cigarette deck at that point. And he was mapping the stars to make sure that their location was correct. And he knew precisely what they were. And he's like, well, there's a small island about two miles from us. We can swim there very easily, but it's known to have a Japanese garrison on it. 
And so this Japanese garrison, if we swim up to that island, we're going to be captured. And we all, they all knew what was the fate of any American servicemen. And some Mariners were particularly disliked by the Japanese because their stealth and their ability to blow things up were torpedoes. And as the war went on, they became more and more proficient. And so it was the enemy that they did not know. It was the enemy that they did not see. It was the enemy that cost an awful lot of life. It was an enemy that they disliked and thought was cowardly because they snuck up and they sunk entire convoys. So some mariners not very well liked. And there are many stories of being very ill-treated by the Japanese of many submariners. And we could go through long lists of that. So this navigation officer, thank goodness they had him. He was able to look up at the stars and say, okay, we can't go to this next island because there's a garrison. But there is a small chain of islands that is 15 miles away from us. We can get there. When they talk about how there was 15 of them and only eight made it to the islands, that's why. I don't think I can swim two laps of the pool. I know I can't swim one lap of the pool these days. But can you imagine? You just watched your submarine sink underneath you. You've just lost 71 of your best friends in the world. You are probably coated with fuel. There is salt water burning your wounds. And at the time, the Navy encouraged you to get rid of any accessories that you did not need, like your pants your shoes, your belts, your tools, because those would weigh you down as you were trying to swim. So all of the young men disrobed as much as they could. And that's gonna be a little problem later on. So they all decide that they're going to swim to the small island of Banya. It takes them 17 hours. When they get there and they pull themselves across the coral reef that surrounds this little island. They're cut up, they're bruised, they're sunburned, they're exhausted, but they are utterly thrilled to be on dry land. They pull themselves onto the island and they bury themselves in the sand, trying to get some rest. After they can give themselves a little bit of rest, then they start to explore the island. And they realize this might not have been the best choice for them because there's no fresh water. But there are a few coconut trees. And I don't know if any of you have ever tried to open a coconut when you do not have a hacksaw mm -hmm. or a hammer or something. Remember what I said? They just took off all their clothes. They were in their bare feet. They're being cut up by the coral. They are laying on the beach in just maybe their underwear and nothing else. So here you find a coconut. What do you do? You're exhausted, but you need nourishment. So you try and break that coconut. And there is long in his book and in Alvin's journal that he wrote after the war, he talks about the amount of energy that they expended just trying to crack the coconut. Eventually, they found a sharp rock, and they were all able to share a little bit of that coconut. And now that water becomes the next great thing. Water, water everywhere, but nothing to drink. You just come in and swum all these hours, but you couldn't take a sip of water because salt water would cause poisoning, which would cause hallucinations, which caused an awful lot more problems than not drinking it. So they had not, the ability not to drink it. What they did was that they found shells and scattered them around themselves, hoping that it would rain so that they could get some fresh water to drink. After they had had a chance to rest a little bit, have their magnificent meal of coconut, try and find a little bit of rain to drink, 
they realize this is not a great place for us. Now, personally, I, I, when I read this, I'm thinking, how can they possibly have had the mental fortitude to do this? I mean, I certainly wouldn't. I think I would be the one panicking and saying, please, somebody come get me. I can't do this, but they did. They looked around, and they saw the palm branches and the palm trees and the vines that were growing in the jungle. They knew that they needed to stick together in order to survive. And how they ever had this mental forethought to build a little raft. And we're not talking that it's anything fancy or even massive. It's just a couple of branches or parts of a tree that they lashed together with the vines that they found in the jungle. And they managed to make an oar out of a couple of flat pieces of wood. And they put Commander Crowley on top of it so that he could see. And they all hung on and took turns taking a rest as they paddled around looking for a suitable island where they could find shelter, fresh water, maybe some food, but oh yeah, avoid the Japanese. I just couldn't imagine possibly being in that type of situation, but they did. And they paddled around for several days, hiding out in little altos around the area, in bushes near islands, trying to find the best spot that they could be in. And it's very difficult. I mean, I don't think I could possibly have carried on that long to be able to do this, but they did. And all eight of them banded together and continued on. This is a picture of Alvin Jacobson going back to that little landing island years and years and years later, probably 45 years later. And he's standing in front of the shells, like what they would have put out around themselves when they slept to catch any rainwater that might have come so that they could have fresh water to drink. And looking behind him at the scrub, and we're not talking great places to like, it's beautiful, it's lovely, we consider them tropical beaches for vacation. Very not hospitable if you have nothing else, but you're looking for a place to hide out and survive. This next photo is Alvin and his son when they went back to the island. So they floated around and they looked for an island where they could possibly survive. And they came upon a plantation. It was a banana plantation. And of course, it had been abandoned at that point because they did not want to be there when the Japanese came. What, the fam what this group of survivors did not know is that before the family had left the plantation, they poisoned the cistern or the well where the water was kept. So the gentlemen, when they get there, think, my gosh, we've hit our lucky stars. There's some place that we can go to be inside. There's fresh water there's shade, and there's food to eat. And they thought, this is incredible. Think about their health right now. In less time than a week, they've been blown up, nearly drowned, swung for 17 hours, slept on a beach in sand, had a coconut or two to eat, were lucky if they found any fresh water to drink. And they pulled themselves up on shore here, and they realized, man, this is good. We can stay here for a little bit and take care of ourselves, nurse our wounds, get some of our strength back. And we've got fresh water. Unfortunately, the water had been poisoned and only one member of the group actually got sick from it. Hopefully it was because the water had dissipated. They go back and forth and discuss in some of their histories of whether or not he got sick from drinking too much water or if he just happened to be the one that got the water that had the poison in it. Now, this banana plantation was actually owned by Captain Mayor. Captain Mayor was the head gorilla. They don't know this at this point. And he had actually gone to school in the, at the University of Kansas, and he had studied agriculture. So he was very familiar with the United States, and he did speak fluent English. This interesting little photo that I included here is 
the way the people around on the island got around. They used caribou and they used wagons. And the caribou were their workhorses. They were the ones that they ate for meat. They were the workhorses. And they're going to help our coast watchers, or excuse me, our survivors very soon to meet our coast watchers. So while they're at the plantation, they hear something in the woods around the plantation. And they're like, well, we've come this far. I'm not giving up yet. We're going to do our best and hide out, and maybe they won't notice that we're here. And maybe we'll be able to get away with this for a little bit while longer. So here they are thinking all of these things that are going on in the back of their minds. And suddenly, a little boy comes out of the jungle and he has this big M1 around his chest and he's carrying it. As I said, we met him in the very first oral history. That was Bob and he was our young man that was about 15 years old when all of this was taking place. And even though he was not actually fighting, he still had responsibilities to his family and to his community and it was his job to go out every day to the plantation to make sure that it was still unoccupied and that there was no one there and the Japanese hadn't landed and that this was his job to go out and do. So he comes out to the plantation and he finds our survivors and they're not in good shape. And no matter what they're saying about, well, we're going to do our best to defend ourselves and we're going to fight, they have no strength left. And so he beckons to them, come, come. Now, what would you be thinking? Do we trust this young man? There was thoughts that ran through their minds of maybe we should just remove this young man. He can't go back and tell them if he can't go back. What should we do? And the young boy beckons them. And so then he starts making motions about eating. And he says the word rice and they follow him. And he takes them to an abandoned schoolhouse. And in the abandoned schoolhouse, he opens up his pack. And in his pack, he has rice and dried fish. He finds some leaves and he gives them his food, these eight men which is an incredible feat for a young person to do. And they begin to trust him a little bit. He encourages them. He has them sitting there eating and then he leaves. And so our eight men are sitting there going, well, now what do we do? Is he gonna come back? Is he bringing the Japanese with him? Or is he going to just have someone come and kill us? Are we being taken to our death? They really don't know. Because these men, unless they were on a submarine that may have delivered some coast watchers, know nothing about them. They know nothing about if there's anyone there that can help them. So the young boy goes back into town and he brings back with him the other men from the village. And with them, they bring carts. And these carts then can take these men to town so that they can have their wounds treated. This is part of the oral history that we did. And this is that same family talking about what it was like on that day. To lay down in the mud, and yes. the, the, what, the, the guy was. Uh, the boy that was trying to, you know, was. With the carbos or with stone. <laughs> what happened? Uh, we have this car, car bows, you know, the, the black buffalo. animal buffalo, water buffalo. Yeah, yes. And um, when they came, they were just, when the um, when the survivors came, they were just, uh, you know, they have to give up their shoes. Mm -hmm. So, and then that coral island. So they had a lot of wounds, and some of them were getting infected, 
you know, and then they had all these blisters, sunburns, blisters from the explosion too, you know. So then they really look terrible, but then the guerrillas already anticipated that, so they made cards that would be pulled by these populace. And so then they were, maybe there were just three cards, but then the Americans were so big, the populace could not even make <laughs> make a headway, you know, to get to get out of our house. And then they said, oh, okay, you know, one cart per person now. So some of the guerrillas had to make another cart, isn't it, Bob? Yeah. And get some more parables. <laughs> it's amazing things that we would never think about in a million years. Can you imagine being in this small little remote town in the Philippines and suddenly there's a group of strangers and all the men in the village are working to save them. They've never met these men before. They know that the Americans are trying to get the Philippines free from the Japanese and they are working hard to do that. And so it is these gorillas that help our survivors first and they bring them back into the village. This is a photo that was taken of the village um, back in the early 1980s. And according to the Jacobson family, it was very similar to what they remembered from that time. Um, simple huts and wonderful people that were willing to help them and hide them until such a time that they could be assisted by the Coast Watchers. Now that group of Coast Watchers, those men of Filipino descent, were not just sitting right in town, you know, sitting around. They were off in the mountains, off to the side. And they couldn't very well call them up because people listened to the traffic that was going on in the radios. And so someone had to physically go and get them and tell them what they found and tell them that there are people here that need your assistance. And they send the person up there and they continue on to do this. And eventually the Coast Watchers are able to come back to the village, just one, to verify that these are Americans, to verify where the ship that they're from and who it is that they need to go back to, who their commanding officers, so they can relay that intelligence because a military runs on its intelligence so much and to know where the Japanese are and to know that the Japanese, I'm sure, saw the same thing that the rest of them did that they saw a submarine go down, they saw an explosion, they know something happened and they're going to be out looking for these people. So it is the Coast Watchers then that get in contact with the American military and bring the information back to help them. To go to the mountains. And then Bob here went along with them. And then he, he was the one who when they were going up to the mountains, you felt that they were feeling uneasy and restless, you know? They're so speaking about the survivors. Up his gun to give it to one of them. I was, I was, I was carrying a carbine. Well, Fifteen. Fifteen at the time. Fifteen of them. Okay. So they felt? They felt more secure. Secure. secure that you're secure, you're that, only being, yeah. That it was okay, you know? Who knows, you know, who's taking them to the mountain there, whether that is their last trip up there. Because the coast watcher were on the mountain. So now we go in there, when they reach the mountain, they were able to contact the coast watcher, contact the crown, so they were all safe. But before that, you know, they were, they were always, they never feel uh, easy or and safe. They, something. Yeah, they were, not, they were feeling uneasy. And I think Mr. Jacobson said that too. Yeah. You know, they, they, they just didn't know what was no. ahead of them, you know. They didn't know if you were being kind, just to take them. So our Coast Watchers up in the mountains make connections and they radio the USS Redfin. Remember that was a submarine that dropped off the Coast Watchers. It is also the submarine that has been quietly 
supplying them with every single thing that they would need that in order to exist on this remote place, everything from weapons to food to medicine to bulbs for those radios that they needed to have. And so they contact the Redfin and they start working out all of the different logistical things that they need to have. And that is the red fin belt, and that's why it's so important to this story right at the very beginning. But here you are, a submarine commander, and you're thinking, is this a hoax? Are these Americans being stood there, told to call, and there's a gun to their head? Or is it someone else that's captured? They don't know. No one has practiced for this particular thing. How do you get a verification from two people that obviously probably didn't know each other, that didn't have some prearranged signal? And even if there was a prearranged signal, if you were being held captive by the enemy and the enemy was not being nice to you, and I say that in the complete utterance of not being nice to you, how can you trust what they're going to say? So. Captain Austin of the Redfin, here's this story from the Coast Watchers. He knew Commander Crowley from school. Okay. They went to Annapolis together and they were in the same quartet. So thinking on his feet knows one of the songs that they sang together in Annapolis in this quartet. And he's hoping beyond hope that Commander Crowley will catch on to what it is that he's doing. And if Commander Crowley sings back the wrong verse or does anything that's even peculiar at this point, he's not going to that island to pick them up. Why would he? Why is he going to rescue 80 men? What could be a trap? Because remember, the Robolo has just gone missing. The Flyer has just gone missing. And he does not want the red fit to go missing. So Captain Austin starts to sing his portion of this song. And Commander Crowley responds with the correct verse. Of course, there was no music, but. <laughs> So you can hear, whoops, sorry. Um, so you can, it really, really wants to continue. So we'll just go to the next slide. So the commanding officer, the Redfin, knows that this is not a setup because he's got to take it on face value that Commander Crowley is capable of not giving anything away and knowing that this is really a test. And so because of this, they arrange a rendezvous in order to pick up our sailors that are stranded on this island, being hidden out by a group of local guerrillas and being hidden out by the coast watchers. So the commanding officer of the Redfin deals directly with the coast watchers and they set up a time and they are supposed to come up in a little inlet by the shore where these men are kept, are being kept. And they have three dates picked out. And so whatever night they will have to keep going back and making sure that it is. So at the assigned time, the submarine comes up. And in quick, quick, quick movements, the men drop the rafts, paddle into shore, and grab the men and paddle back, but there is an electrician on board. And this is the first set of survivors from the sinking of a submarine. 
that they have ever known to be rescued without being put into a prison or a war. He is so excited about this that he takes the only thing that he has with him, which is a little bit of money. And when he rows over to the Coast Watchers to get them, he quickly has all the Coast Watchers sign his picture. And he puts it back in his pocket. And that's his good luck for the rest of the war. Because what do you do to memorialize a situation like that where something so monumental has happened that we've rescued eight men? We've brought them back and they will go back to America and they will be safe and they will not have been put into a POW camp. This is a photo of seven of the eight men that have been rescued by the Coast Watchers and then by the Redfin. They're on the death of the Redfin. The eighth man, unfortunately, was too ill at that point to be brought back up on deck. And as you can tell, after being washed up and given some new clothing, they don't look too bad. But look at how young they are. I mean, they're just young boys for the most part. As I said before, Alvin Jacobson is a local resident. He grew up in Grand Haven, and after the war, he came back to Grand Haven. And he raised his family, went into the family business, but his passion was always to find out what happened to that submarine. Because it's not like you have this great GPS ability where there's beacons going off that can lead you to the submarine. They didn't know exactly. They had swum for so many hours. How could they pinpoint exactly where they were at? So he made it his life's mission with his family to try and find out what actually happened. This is the video that was giving me a little bit of trouble. So hopefully it'll work. If not, I'll switch screens real fast. They spent their entire, he spent his life looking for it. He got a hold of the commercial dive team and there was a television program called Dive Detectives. And he worked with them to go back and find the submarine. Submarine, the flinchers descend to the bottom. Sorry, this ends. Our ship comes into Give me one second and I will pull up the video again for you. Not sure why it just didn't like that, but. Thank you. Submarine, the Fletchers descend to the bottom. A dark shape comes into focus. Way off in the distance, I can see a shadowy. Submarine, the Fletchers descend to the bottom. A dark shape comes into focus. Way off in the distance, I can see a shadowy outline. <laughs> Full of that anticipation, thinking this is going to be the flyer. Immediately, I recognize the deck on the bow of the sub. It's got to be a Gato class submarine. I can tell just the shape and the dimensions. My feelings are balanced by the fact that. You're essentially in a graveyard, and only meters away from the graves of dozens of American sailors. I'm constantly drawn back to the relationship between Steve up above us and his deceased father. They clearly are, are trying to identify the sub, but at the same time, they're being very careful, recognizing that this is a grave site and it's something to be worked with very carefully as an archaeologist would work with it. They discover the bow of the submarine is gone back to the first bulkhead, possibly due to impact on the sea floor. They search deeper inside and find forward torpedo tubes stacked in two columns of three, an exact match with Gato class submarines. Uh, 
this is an important discovery, strongly suggesting it is the USS Flyer. They move along the sub and note the forward deck gun matches the flyer's gun placement during her last mission. Then they see why this sub went down. Mike swims up to a massive hole ripped in the sub's side. We could see a huge implosion point on the starboard side. As soon as I saw that, in my mind, we had found the flyer. The starboard side hull damage under the conning tower matches Al Jacobson's eyewitness report of the flyer's last moments. explore more, but they're out of time for this dive. They begin the slow process of ascent and decompression. Submarine. The Full of that anticipation thinking, this is good. So they were able to find the submarine after Alvin Jacobson passed away, and it has been left as memorial, it has not been disturbed, and it is there for those men as their final resting place. And some of the answers have been given to those family members that didn't know anything that happened to their family members. One of the stories that particularly gets me always is that when you go out to the exhibit, you'll see a series of letters in the very last case. There was a young man by the last name of Dressel. His mother was a proficient writer and wrote to him all the time. And so the tone of her letters changes over the course of time because no one knows what happened to the sub. It just goes away. And the American government cannot tell the immediate family right away because that will give away secrets to the Japanese that would know where they were at and what was going on. So this mother writes her son a letter and I'm, I'm kind of paraphrasing and it's like, hello son, I had care you're having a great time out there. I'm glad you're having so much fun. Drop me a note sometime, let me know you're okay. Then the next one, with a little bit more. I haven't heard from you in a while. Just write me a note, send me a postcard. Anything you can tell me would be wonderful. And the third one that breaks my heart is the one where she's pleading. Just, just do anything, just let me know that you're there. And this series of letters is there and it's in the form of email that has been reproduced in a smaller format and the letters, the original letters had been returned to them. So what happened when after the sub went down, the American military knew, the Navy knew that they had lost contact with it when they failed to report in. They tried doing some basic investigation, but until the Coast Watchers had gotten in contact with the Red Fin, they were unable to do much about it. Also in the exhibit is a copy of the report that the Coast Watchers had written so that keeping track of item by item of the time, the time frame when they were found out about them, the steps that were taken, what was done to be able to get them on the ship, all of that is all chronicled in the exhibit in out in the cases out there. And so if you're interested in reading them, please, by all means, do. This photo means a lot to me. This is a photo that happened in 1992. And 
The gentleman in the white is the electrician off of the right hand. The gentleman in the blue is Philip Placido. After their work was declassified in 1990, the electrician sought Philip Placido out and he hunted him. I won't say hunted in a bad word, but hunted him down so that he could find him because he wanted to know what happened to all of those men that were embedded on the island. This is a photo of them meeting in California where the electrician gives Philip Placido back that peso that all of them signed. Um, the original peso is kept up in our archives because it's um, not stable enough to be left out on display. And so a very good color copy of that is out on display so that we can replace it in case it fades or anything like that. And so that is there. So these men, this amazing things that they did, they were not allowed to talk about. And they had to keep all of that inside of them <clears throat> over the course of time. But it meant so much to each and every one of them that they went to that trouble to bring them out and to find each other in order to return that peso. From our, sorry, let me go back again. Staticky fingers tonight. There was another gentleman, sorry, staticky fingers, sorry. Mr. Nordoff, sorry. He is from Holland. And he is another person, unfortunately, did not survive the sinking of the flyer. But he is another young man from our own community area, West Michigan. And we honor him as well as all of the men that did not return from the USS Flyer. And Mr. Norda, he is one of those that we talk about frequently. And he actually is, his story is in the museum in Holland in their World War II section as one of their heroes of World War II. After listening to the story here tonight, I hope you understand why it is so important for us to tell the story of our submariners and why each year on the Sunday of Memorial Day weekend, we host our lost boat ceremony, where we highlight all of the men that did, are on eternal patrol, that did not return. There was 52 submarines that sank during World War II and over 3,500 men that passed away. The submarine service was the smallest in the Navy, but they had the highest percentage of death and those that did not return. And so it is our honor to be able to tell their stories and to continue on to letting everyone know the heroic sacrifices that they had and to honor those that were able to come back because they could easily have been the ones that didn't come back. And now this, this particular history doesn't go into death charging, doesn't go into firing torpedoes. It doesn't go into the difficult living situations or any of that thing. For that, I will tell you to come back for another night and we'll have different topics. But it's one of those amazing stories that is so little known. But it's so impactful that young men are capable of so much. And those young men come back. There was one gentleman that was the only living survivor of the flyer when we opened the exhibit. It must be nine years ago now. Um, and he missed the boat. And um, he had done something that got him thrown in the brig. And he was really feeling bad about telling his mother that he was in trouble and that he was in the brig and he missed the boat and he was going to see some, you know, some serious punishment from the Navy for that. And then to find out what happened to the rest of the members of that crew. It's something that lived with him forever and very difficult. Um, does anyone have any questions on any of the presentations? Wonderful. Oh, thank you. So my um, husband's father was on a submarine. Mm -hmm. He was blown up. 
so it might have been a ship. So I'm going to say ship for some reason. Okay. But um, um, he was, um, I don't know, a very small number of survivors, but he, they didn't know who he was. They were six months after they rescued him before they figured out, and he was so injured. That he couldn't help them. He couldn't help them. So, you know. Um, Think about this. Can you imagine if this is your only form of identification? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And one of the stories we talk about here quite a bit is uh, Joe Byerly, another local Muskegon person, oh, yeah. and how his dog tags were stolen from him mm -hmm. and the confusion that that caused. And so what happened to your grandfather? Did he, was he okay when he came back or? Well, he was in a hospital for six months and um, began to recover. He had, um, um, he recovered enough, he was a fireman um, in Boston. He was a, the second generation and wow. he was able to serve but he had he had um, um damage um you know had bad terrible headaches and it was really difficult you know for him to you know, it took him a long time to get told yeah it's amazing you know when we refer to them as the greatest generation it's so true now um <clears throat> there are three very good books written on the subject of the uss flyer one is surviving the flyer, one is AIDS survived, and one is called the USS Flyer. Um, some of them are available in our gift store, but if any of you want to read more, I will gladly give you all the information on them. And um, I encourage you to spend some time in the exhibit and see some of the artifacts. The video that's in there is different than what I've talked about. It doesn't include all this. Yes. When Jacob's son and those guys came back, um, were they allowed to talk about this or or no? I worked, you know, for JFK for 40 years, and this was never, I didn't know anything about it until, you know, just recently. So when they first came back, no, because intelligence was so important. The question was, were they allowed to talk about it? Not right away. Um, Alvin actually wrote down his memoirs about it and his mother typed it, but he would have gotten into a great deal of trouble <laughs> if he had, if that had gotten out um, at that point because it was secretive. Um, Alvin went on to serve on another submarine wing um, during his time. And um, at first, no, most of them that came back, they didn't really want to talk about it. And they were not sworn to secrecy the same way that the Coast Watchers were. Those who were involved in clandestine, they were not had those secrets allowed to be discussed until the 1990s. And a lot of people did not know anything about this until they read it in the death notices and found out. Yes. I think in your, in your presentation, you, you, you mentioned two different uh, shipyards that produced subs. How many, how many different locations in shipyards did produce? Mm -hmm. So to the best of my knowledge, it's three. Just three. Just three. Now I could be wrong on that, but I can find that exact answer out. But Mare yeah. Isle, Groton, and Manitowoc, Wisconsin. I could be wrong. There could be another one out there, but I will look that up for you. Um, Mare Isle in California and in um in Groton. Yeah. Oh, that wasn't um, what was the other one in, it was on the East Coast. It's the electric boat company. Portsmouth, thank you. So the yeah. exhibit at Manswap is wonderful. It is. Oh my it god. Is. How many subs were produced in World War II? 200. 200 and I would have to look up the exact number for you. I'm sorry. I don't have a 20-ish or so. Yeah. It um there was quite there was quite a few. And most of them at the end of the war were either scrapped, sold. And ours was actually put into training service mm -hmm. at the end of the war. So there's not a lot of them left. So. Oh, you're very welcome. Any other questions that I can answer for anyone? Yes. Albert Jacobson was the, what was his position on the flyer? He was one of the officers on the flyer. Uh, he was Let's Lieutenant see. JG at this point. So um, thank you all for coming. Please spend some time next time you're at the museum. 
you know, next week I'll make sure that I leave the exhibit open longer so that you can see it beforehand and see we, the problem with exhibits is you have a limited amount of space. And as they used to say, and for the rest of the story, <laughs> there is always more and you just can't possibly put it in there. And some of the things that you'll see in the exhibit are unique and different, like little playing cards that the Coast Watchers used to have that they would hand out to the kids on the island so that if they saw a plane going by, they would be able to identify and say, I saw this one and um, the reading material and you know how you communicate it and so many different things, the size of the radio, the lovely rations that they were given and um, the living conditions that they were in and the social oddities that they had to deal with, with being an enemy combatant hidden in an occupied country. And so there's so many more parts to the story that you want to tell it all, but you just can't do that when you can only have an eight minute video and you want to tell it. So thank you all for coming and listening to more of the story. And we look forward to seeing you all next week. And please bring a friend with you. And if any of you are interested, there is more posters in the gift store, Teresa has them, any coffee shop, bookstore, library, any place that you're going, you think that there might be people that are interested in these stories, spread the word, let them know what it is. This lecture, as well as our other ones, we're usually about a week behind after we, um, after we do the lectures that our social media person takes the video and cleans it up and makes it presentable and then puts it on YouTube. How many on Zoom are participating? Um, I don't, Teresa is the one that's doing Zoom right now. So for me, because I couldn't quite do them all at one time. No. Yeah, so I don't know how many are on Zoom. Yeah, yeah, so I don't know quite how many. But thank you all for coming. Any other questions? Yeah.